I'm Lindy and this is Ainsley. We are consultants with the Families for Inclusive Education project here at CRU. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the First Nations people as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, which here is, is at South Brisbane. Uh, and the country um, north and south of the Brisbane River um, is, I recognise, as the home of both the Turrbal and Jagera nations. And I pay my deep respects to the elders past and present. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here today. Uh, I suppose we really thought this was an important topic because Crew has always worked in the space for the last um, few decades, been a bit over three decades now, Crew has always existed in the space of challenging ideas and practices which limit the lives of people with disability. Um, it does aim to inspire and encourage people to pursue better. And, um, and so this topic is very close to Ainsley's and my um, hearts. Uh, we are both parents of children with disability. Um, I have a background as an occupational therapist. So Ainsley will be doing most of today because she is the educator. Um, but uh, my daughter, who's now in, in year 10, um, when she began, I think I was just grateful to have her physically present in a mainstream class. Um, and then over time, I realised I had to become more clear in asking for more because from year to year, if I was to let things go as they were going to go, um, she was sort of less and more a participant, sometimes not a participant, um, an active participant in the class, sometimes sort of sitting to the side. And, and I realised I had to actually get clearer on what authentic inclusion in a mainstream class, classroom would look like for my girl. Um, and I'm happy to say she's having a, a really lovely time heading into senior studies, but it has taken time. Um, we're going to start with a poll um, because, uh, you know, we're, we're all at different places with our understanding. So we thought a really great time to, to start getting to know each other would be at the start of the session. Um, so Ainsley's going to set that up. Yes, it's my first poll, so I'm hoping it all goes smoothly. <laughs> so it is an, an anonymous. I'm going to stumble on my words a bit nervous today. Um, so your names won't appear with this. It just gives us an idea of where people are at. Just now, there we, there we go. And we'll give you a minute. And hopefully Hooray. that comes up for you when you're ready, if you press submit, and then when everyone's submitted, it should come up with some percentages. And then after that, we're going to head into some breakout rooms and hopefully this will sort of get your head in the space, in the zone for the workshop and some discussion happening. Click on end polling. All right. And share results. Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have 77% feel like they have a fair understanding. So a quarter, not too sure what an inclusive classroom looks like. 31% um, don't feel their children are included in the same classroom or subject content. 77% uh, not sure about the key strategies that make full classroom inclusion possible. So that's why you're here today. And that's hopefully right. we can pick that percentage up. Yeah. 54% um, um, don't feel they're actually consulted well um, or participated well in consultation with their teachers. And half, um, half feeling confident, half not feeling confident. So it's a bit of a 50-50 advocating for child's full inclusion. Um, so we hope to deal with all of that today. So um, really wonderful to have you all here. Um, we're going to put you all into a breakout room so you can get to meet and introduce yourselves to each other. Um, so we will split you up now. There we go, how's that? There we go, okay. <laughs> So first of all, we're going to cover why. Why is an inclusive classroom important? Why is curriculum inclusion best for everyone? Um, and we'll touch on the medical versus the social model. The how is um, through the Australian curriculum, age equivalent curriculum clarity, universal design for learning or UDL, 
quality differentiated teaching practice, otherwise known as QDTP, and adjustments. So reasonable adjustments are provided for under law. Uh, but Ainsley will go through all of those wonderful acronyms and further unpack that for us parents, which I realise that is a lot to get your head around, but um, my tongue might get tied. <laughs> I'm still trying to get differentiated, <laughs> right? Um, and then what does it actually look like? So um, we, we do have some examples, some practical examples, because I've always found that helpful to look at things other parents are seeing happening in their classrooms. And I'll share some things that um, my, that's been given to my girl over the years and and um, and friends of mine as well. So you can sort of get a bit of a practical idea of what it looks like. Um, so, and sample adjustments, there's some great resources out there that Ainsley will share. Um, we'll talk about consultations and that's the process where um, parents and students are consulted before adjustments are put in place on what they're actually needing in a classroom. Um, and, and some quick tips for advocacy at the end. And I think, um, what what we what needs to be said at the start is a crew here we always um, stand the position of nurturing the relationship um, between educator and and family um, that's super important and at uh, different times in my girl's schooling life there were times where i was advocating for her to physically be included there were times where she needed support socially and then there were times that i was asking for a bit more of the academic and curricular inclusion. And it's always good to be mindful of not bombarding. And, and, and so today we want to inform you and we, we do want to educate you because it is important to know about things and to, to feel more sure of what you ask for. But also at the end of the day, we want you to be strategic about how you ask for those things. And that honestly is the most important thing is to be able to clarify and prioritise what you would like to ask for, depending on how the situation is at your school. So we work from three aspects of inclusion. So we have uh, physical inclusion. So children with disability fully included physically in classrooms um, with their non-disabled peers. Social inclusion is inclusion um, at camps, um, in the playground at lunch times, extracurricular activities. Um, curriculum inclusion is what we're talking about today. So that is the in the classroom, um, the supports and adjustments that take place to make sure that everyone is contributing and participating. Um, but above all, inclusion is very much feeling that everyone belongs, that everyone is valued and welcomed in their regular schools and in their regular classrooms. So. So that's um, just to bring everybody up to speed with where we're starting at today. And I'll pass over to Ainsley. Thank you very much, Lindy. Okay, taking over the controls. <laughs> it looks like the mouse is the way to go, hey? Is that right? Next. Okay, so I'm gonna start by having just a little brush over the research and evidence that's behind inclusion and particularly behind curriculum inclusion. So a reminder that uh, with the, the UN's uh, CRPD, the Convention on Rights of People with Disability, that it states that it's a human right for um, all to be included and particularly in, um, in the class in an inclusive school. And it is something that is a pathway to that ordinary life, a life that's free of poverty, isolation and exploitation. The research and evidence strongly supports, there's over 50 years of it now, the research and evidence um, that inclusive education provides the best academic and social outcomes for not just the children with disability, but for their peers and also um, for their teacher skills. Uh, the percentages um, tell, the, tell the facts there when it comes to employment. Uh, the children who are involved in inclusive classrooms have a far greater chance of getting a uh, a job that, um, that they're interested in, that they are earning good income from. So, and it builds that independence and social belonging. The school of course benefits greatly because they're getting that great mix of diversity and learning how to accommodate difference. And teachers in inclusive classrooms are master teachers. They can teach everybody. And finally, Inclusion, of course, is a foundation for inclusive communities. It makes our communities more together, more whole, and ready to tackle problems and issues together. 
Okay, so that then brings me to the, the thinking that we're trying to move our schools and our societies um, to. So I know that we, Lindy and I don't have our rose colored glasses on. We, we know that a lot of what we're talking about today is not precisely happening in our schools. Some schools are a long way from delivering what we're talking about. Um, but with the inclusive education policy, with the various legislation, with the work of advocates and parents and the work of crew, we are starting to see more and more people get their head around that move that needs to be made from that traditional medical model through to the more modern and social model. So with the traditional medical model, that's where assumptions are often made about how much that child can interact and learn. They will often look to the diagnosis and the reports, the functional impact and make decisions from that instead of having a good look at the child as a person. Um, there's not a lot of power or choice given in what um, is delivered to the child. It's pre-decided what they will be learning and how they will be interacting. It can be very restrictive. So um, often that means that learning is not um, provided at an age appropriate level. So you might have someone in year six being provided exact prep curriculum. Um, there's often low expectations that really they couldn't cope with what the class is learning. And it sets them up for that bit of a predetermined path that they're going to be heading on a bit of a different pathway that's not going to provide that ordinary life that their peers are being placed upon. So with curriculum inclusion, it's very much um, working with the social model, the more modern model. So we're presuming confidence with the child, um, particularly important when we have children with communication issues, that we're presuming there's lot more capability than what we might be thinking is is there we're valuing the diversity the students being given some parent choice and we'll talk about that when that comes to the consultations of how we can provide that parent choice to children and particularly to children who might have complex communication difficulties and in doing all this we're creating limitless potential for the child so we're opening up many pathways to them so that they can have that ordinary um, <clears throat> path but like their peers are opening up the pathway to a good life. So now we get into the nitty gritty stuff. How does it all work? So often um, we'll have parents come to us because we're caring parents. We care often for the teachers as well. And we think, oh my gosh, how are the teachers gonna be able to do all this? Well, that's why I want to go through how it all works today. So you can see that if, if done well, this um, planning for inclusion, it really does often alleviate a lot of the stress um, for teachers and um, provides them with much easier and happier days. So how does it work? So we start right back. First place is to have a look at the Australian curriculum and to let you know that the Australian curriculum is actually a very flexible curriculum. So it's designed in a way so that um, the, the, the teacher can have children enter at different points and at different avenues along the way. So if you have a look here, there's, um, if we have different curriculums for each child, it's gonna mean inequitable access. So one general curriculum, so we promote one general curriculum is best for all. It's a standards based curriculum. So it means that um, at particular year levels, they're expected to meet particular standards. Most international um, curriculums are standard based, but that's not restrictive because the design is very flexible. It's universally designed. So the way that it works, if a child's doing um, say volcanoes in year seven or climate change, they can have a look back and see where similar content is being taught in year one and two. So there's that, that design of it so that the, the same sort of content is covered, key content throughout the year levels. Uh, so that makes it flexible in the way that we can move between year level points for different students. Um, that also we have the general capabilities. So those are interwoven into the regular subjects those general capabilities are what helps children become lifelong learners. So we'll talk about those general capabilities along the way too. And for students where they're having trouble working out 
um, if they can be entering into that prep level curriculum, they'll often look towards the general capabilities to be able to help them get into that curriculum area. I do apologize, I've lost my presenter's notes. They're not coming up on the screen. This is why I'm having to check over here a little bit. So, okay, so the how. So they've got the Australian curriculum, it's flexible. There's certain ways that we can get the, the students uh, into the Australian curriculum. So how does that then work when the teacher sits down to plan? So the teacher's going to identify some key elements of a specific unit of study and map out what all students will need to know, think and do. So say they're having a look at their maths for term one, so they've got to sit down first of all and go, right, what do I want all my students to be able to know, think and do? The teacher then unpacks the complexity of the curriculum and opens up the curriculum's true rigour for all students. So they'll have a look through for those key words, key terms. What is it that I'm really going to hone in on for all my students in the classroom? The teacher will work out all that can be done so that all students can take part in meaningful age equivalent curriculum. And we'll talk about universal design in a little bit, but this is where they put on their universal design glasses and they have a look at how can I design the activities within this unit of work so that I can get all of the children involved in the key year level curriculum. Um, this should always be the starting point before any level of differentiation. I've got to have my tongue tied today. Um, or adjustment. So that's where we start. So they've got the curriculum out. The Australian Curriculum website too, um, something you probably shouldn't really need to know as teachers, but uh, it's very flexible in the way that teachers can select different year levels. They can put them side by side. There's all sorts of great ways that they can have that already there for them on the screen to be able to work out how best to, to arrange things for the students. So as they're sitting down that early stage, the teachers have got the, as I said, the universal design for learning goggles on. So universal design is, comes from originally um, back it, sort of around the 1960s and pre 1960s, when schools were starting to look at ways to um, allow more students with physical difficulties disabilities into the schools. So that universal design and architecture was really the starting place for the universal design for learning. So once schools were being able to physically include students, then it brought them to the point of, right, how are we going to include these students in the curriculum? So the, the mindset then moved to that universal design for learning. And there's an organisation called CAST who, which are the go-to for universal design for learning. And it was in the 1980s where they came up with some specific guidelines for universal design, a framework. And that's what's on the right of the screen there, the universal design for learning guidelines. So universal design uh, is a proactive response to diversity from the outset. Ideally, universal design guidelines would be used as a teacher sits down to do those early sections of the planning. It ensures those barriers to learning are removed and UDL doesn't affect the rigour of the curriculum. So we're not looking at having children go from year six content to year two content or skills at this stage. We're just looking to look at keeping that rigour of the curriculum and looking at little tweaks we can make to include all students. So there's three main um, areas there for universal design. There's your representation, action and expression, and your engagement. So those are our three main areas that teachers will be looking at within the lessons. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now, is share just some examples of what UDL might look like at this stage of the planning. So the engagement is getting the children into the learning, um, interested and up and going. So things like factoring in the student's interests. So having a think about what particular interests students may have in the class as a whole, might be a year level's really interested in something or some particular students are interested in something and making sure that's highlighted in the unit of work. 
providing choice. So as they're designing the lessons, that they're giving the children choice. Okay, we're going to need to share this information. Could we provide choice at that stage of the lesson where the children might like to um, choose whether they want to listen to the teacher, watch a video, or read the information with a peer? So that children just feel like they've got a choice in what they're going to do, really get some, okay, I can do this, I want to get engaged. And collaborative learning activities, making sure they're working with partners, peers, different children in the class. Children often will be really excited when they know that they're going to be learning alongside their classmates. Representation. So we'll talk more soon about language friendly instruction. So that means that we're uh, ensuring that the content is presented in the way that all of the children are going to be understanding the, the key information and able to access it. That there's digital and accessible text available. So those options are available for students, particularly as they get up to year three, four and beyond, those students who might be having literacy difficulties or might have sight difficulty. Um, we're providing audio, visuals and concrete materials. They're all there on hand for the students. And that the visual prompts and things like visual storyboards are also put into action for students who really need or are uh, really access that information through visual supports. The action expression. So that's where we're getting the children to show their content knowledge. So we might have some uh, small group activities, the use of concrete materials to show that they've learned the information presented by them, always getting to write it down and allowing a variety of modes. So it might be manipulating the concrete materials using mind maps, they might create a PowerPoint, um, audio recordings, demonstrations. Often schools seem to be locked into thinking, all right, we have to do a test or we need a written test or we need to do a written essay. There's nothing in the Australian curriculum, hello, <laughs> um, nothing in the Australian curriculum that states that they um, have to do these things. That's where it gets, that's where schools start to form those barriers. The curriculum is actually a lot more flexible. It doesn't mention the exact ways that students are supposed to present their learning. That's where it's up to the teachers to put in that universal design for learning. Okay, now Lindy, we've got that next breakout room. So we're gonna spend another three, about three minutes in a breakout room. We're gonna be asking you to discuss your initial thoughts on universal design for learning and any key UDL um, uh, ideas that you may, be thinking about for your child or that you may have already seen that have worked well that you might want to share with the people in the group. So I'm going to zoom you off into your breakout rooms. We'll see you soon. I might just, um, before you do duck off, um, I might just um, say like in, in my girl's life. So um, while, you know, you can't tell a, a teacher, can you please use universal design for learning before, you know, <laughs> before any of your lessons? Um, it is handy to know that things are possible and it's handy to know what actually suits your child. So for Millie, um, visuals are very, very um, essential actually for her feeling calm, because she might just get lost with a lot of um, verbal communication. So having a visual plan, even if um, there's a change or something, that actually helps her feel like she's a lot more in control and knows what's happening next. Um, so that's an example. So um, while obviously if you were universally designing, you would have that for everybody, um, and certainly when there have been visuals, that's helped everybody in her class. Um, this is a, just a chance for you to have a little bit of a play and, and a bit of a, a think about the different types of aspects that might help your child. So I'll send you off to your breakout rooms Thanks, now. Cindy. So I think at this point, it's a good point to just pause a little bit and just get a view of what an inclusive classroom or what inclusive classroom learning does not look like first of all so these are the things that we we are hoping not to see but yes I do realize that we still often do see oh my there we go so if the child's been provided a separate curriculum to their peers not what um, inclusive classroom learning should look like the teacher aid is by the student's side at most times. Something that we have found is not favourable and research evidence has found is not favourable. We'll have some information about that soon. 
when they're provided the same curriculum with little or no accommodation. So this is to the other extreme. So they have students who are provided that separate curriculum than other students who may not get any adjustments and just provided the same curriculum as their um, non-disabled peers. So children who are taken regularly out of the classroom to attend separate lessons, that's not ideal. And um, yeah, we want the children in the classroom getting the support they need there, not outside of the classroom. If the child is unfamiliar to and with their classmates, so they're not getting that really rich social interaction as well. And that can often come about through curriculum inclusion, that uh, social inclusion as well. When they're learning the same content as their peers, they can interact with them not only during the lesson, but during a playtime if they're talking or doing things relating to the learning in class. When the teacher refers to the teacher aide or support person, so if you're meeting with the teacher aide, with the teacher, and they keep referring to the teacher aide's notes, it's probably a sign that inclusive classroom learning is not taking place. When the desk is set away from others in the classroom, um, that's often very common for students. When they're provided alternative activities and options than their other peers with disability. Now I've got a, a good quote here from uh, John Hattie, who you may have heard of. He's an Australian researcher who has done a lot over the last few years with changing the mindset around education. So those students receiving the most support from teacher aides made less progress than similar pupils who received on little or no support from teacher aides. So it's quite stunning the research and his research is is um, known to be of a very high standard and quality. Uh, teacher aides work more often with the students that most need expertise. So really we should be seeing the teacher who's the expert in the room, working with the child, not independently, but making sure they're present in the groups, checking on them more than the teacher aid being by the child's side. Um, yeah, so some interesting information there from John Hattie to, to let you have a think about. And there's a fair bit of information online regarding that as well. If you, if you type in John Hattie, you'll see some information, more information regarding that and research. So, right here, let's go to the positives. What should an inclusive learn, classroom learning look like? So the child's desk is included right in amongst the other desks. The teacher is being able to identify your child's strengths and needs. So when you get along to me and the teacher's not stumbling, they know your child well. They're able to identify those strengths. The support staff encourage the independent work. So the teacher aides are there, um, the learning support staff encouraging the child to be independent, finding ways to bring down those barriers so that they can be and providing support when necessary. And um, trying to encourage that peer support, that natural support in the classroom for the child with disability. The child is attending all other activities as well. There's physical education lessons, the play times, excursions, the camps with their same age peers. The child isn't just working with other children who are having learning struggles most of the time. They're working with mixed ability peers. That's really important so that they're getting that good modeling of how to go about the learning from those children who are more capable. The child is familiar to and with their other classmates. The child is a respected and is a valued class member. So the children want them there. They're celebrating having that child in their classroom. They see that child as a friend and somebody that they really want there each and every day. Children with disability in the classroom with their peers the majority of the day. That's what it should look like. And children learning key curriculum content that is the same or similar to their peers with appropriate support. And that's where we're gonna to go to next, how that can happen. So a lot of that is can be found on our um, crew website and our Fifi page in the resources section. Um, we have a tab there that's all about um, learning. So a document called the inclusive class is there and is it inclusion and, and that's all mapped out from there. So, so I stole some of those ideas there. So we've gone through all of that, the teacher sitting down with the Australian curriculum, having a look at their unit of work, putting on their universal design goggles and seeing what ways they can bring down the barriers using the universal design principles. Now they're having a look and thinking, you know, I've got a few children here, I think are going to have difficulties entering the curriculum still. 
So that's where we can now turn to the NCCD. So I'm hoping most of you have heard about the NCCD. It's something that's come into our education system over the last 10 years or so. So it's a nationally consistent collection of data. My tongue didn't get tired, thank goodness. Um, where the, the school is responsible for letting the federal government know exactly what adjustments and accommodations are being made in their school for students who that they are identifying as having a disability. So basically um, students are uh, counted in the NCCD if they receive ongoing adjustments. So these are not students who have got a verified disability. Yes, they are part of the NCCD, but it can also be students that teachers are seeing are having difficulties entering the curriculum and need these adjustments to be able to enter it on the same basis as their peers. So they don't need to have a formal diagnosis. So the NCCD actually uses the definition of disability from the Disability Discrimination Act, and it provides the educators educators with that guidance on the level of adjustment that might re be required for different students. The good thing to know is that it starts out very similar to what we did with that curriculum planning stage. So the teachers are looking at the quality differentiated, I've got it right, teaching practice, and um, some supplementary adjustments. So really that's, I like to think, good universal design for learning at that stage. So there's no change to the actual curriculum content. They're not changing the rigor of the curriculum. So if they've done that, they've tweaked a little bit more for specific students, then they might need to have a look at some substantial and extensive adjustments for those students who need a little bit more. So the substantial adjustments are looking at working with children who um, are having difficulty still entering that same exact same content as their peers. So they might then need to have a look at, okay, we're going to have a look at that key content in year six that we're doing in science, if it's about weather, and we're going to map down to the year level where we think that child is at. And a lot of thought has to go in before they do that. And it needs to be, all along with the NCCD, they need to be notifying parents of the adjustments that they're making before they're put in place, particularly when it gets to the stage of going at a different uh, year level juncture, because of course that does as we mentioned before, alter some of those pathways for the students. The extensive adjustments are for students where they might have what we call a highly individual, individualized curriculum program, where they're having difficulties finding how they can get them on at that foundation level of curriculum and above. And that's where they turn to the general capabilities to guide them with the um, expectation that they will be working that student to get them onto the foundation and above curriculum. We'll break all that down a little bit more soon. I know that's a lot there, but that just gives you a gist of the NCCD and how that can be um, a good guide for teachers. In the last two years, there's been some funding attached to the NCCD as well. Um, but as we know, funding doesn't always equal inclusion. So it's really, as you'll see today, that good teaching practice that we really wanna see coming through. Okay, so what is this QT? QDTP. So we're going to go down and break that down and what it, what it should look like in the classroom. And this is really that infrequent or occasional um, adjustments that might need to be made. Again, really just good universal design, but they do give it the specific title. So it's looking at the diversity. So the teacher as they're planning and as they're teaching throughout the day is thinking about the diversity in their classroom. So what are the backgrounds of the children? What's their prior knowledge is? Variability. The teacher knows the student as a learner. The teacher is aware of the individual strengths and weaknesses, like we talked before, what an inclusive classroom should look like. The teacher should know their students well. And those early weeks of the term is all about getting to know the students so that they're able to do this um, slight changes to the children. Uh, the predictability. So the teacher is also aware of the commonalities that exist between the students and how they might better use those for help with the activities in the classroom and the universal response. So knowing how to respond to those commonalities. So there might be some students uh, 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 who particularly have difficulties around literacy. So knowing how to respond to that so that they're, they're getting that um, across to a variety of students there without having to 
do specific changes for each child. And very good to know at this point too that this uh, level of work by teachers is actually expected. It's part of the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers and you can find all those online, but the two that we um, turn to each time are those two at the bottom of the screen. So I hope you have a little read of those. Okay, so those are those early levels of adjustment. So now we get into um, some of the more uh, detailed levels of adjustments for students. So, Supplementary adjustments come next. So that's a level of adjustment that still doesn't alter the rigor of the curriculum um, and can be offered um, to all really, all students could be offered these as a choice and should be. Um, so it might be a change of the context to match the interest. So if a child's really interested in Minecraft, you might get them to, to work on this um, assessment task that's got to focus on Minecraft to get that interest in. A change of mode of assessment. So for a student with literacy difficulties, instead of writing an essay, they might get them to do a PowerPoint presentation. Supports for literacy, for example, assistive technology, supplementary adjustment doesn't affect that rigor of the curriculum. Providing scaffolding, things like graphic organizers are excellent for many students so that they've got that extra scaffolding there and at the ready. And um, breaking assessments into manageable parts, even if there's like a, an exam, we might work that over a week instead of giving them to that child all in one block. So those can actually be accessed by everybody, those supplementary adjustments are really just good universal design, but the NCCD does note them as supplementary for those children who um, are accessing the NCCD, but just need those um, little adjustments as they go. So for students who we need to do a little bit more for, we have the substantial level of adjustment. So that level of adjustment is when the student's exposed to year level content, but the focus of the learning will align with a different curriculum point in that um, foundation to onwards curriculum. So the provision of curriculum content, um, and sorry, the provision of curriculum and modified access points to align with the alternate curriculum access points. So if you're looking at whether in year six, then you map down where that child is at. And lots of having a look at the child's skills and abilities needs to be done to make sure you're getting that right access point for the child and you're not going too low or too high. Using a variety of formats and locations to capture student performance. So that's an example. So they might, all right, we might need to do some videoing here. We might need to do some uh, working outside with this activity to be able to get that idea of where they're at with the understanding. And you also might adjust the literacy demands to align with that alternate access point. So if they're accessing at year two, you might make sure the demands you're placing on them for literacy are around that level. But they're still getting that key content delivered to them, very similar to what their same age peers are. The next level of adjustment is extensive. So at this level, the child is exposed to the year level curriculum content still, but the, the learning and assessment will align with some individual learning goals. Either, these are the children are on what we call a highly individualized curriculum program. The children that are using those general capabilities to access the curriculum. So some examples of what that might look like in the classroom is they're having, um, they might have, uh, individually uh, delivered modeling of what they need to do, um, prompting and practice. And there might be some highly assistive, uh, highly specialized assistive technology. Um, there might be something like a pod book, some prolo to go, those sorts of AAC programs that are coming on board for these students. Um, and providing a range of alternative ways to assess and progress achievement. So I know for my son, they will lay out some images and get him to move those around to show his understanding. So looking at all those sorts of alternative ways, and we'll give you some example of those soon. So there are different adjustment types, which I think is good to cover as well. So you get a good grasp on what should be or could be available for your child. And I've got in here the different levels too of adjustment. So there's adjustments that are made when the teacher's at that planning stage. So a universal design, personalized learning plan for a student. That's actually 
universal design. So that for those children who may not have a ICP or a HICP, there's a possibility of having that personalised learning plan to say, all right, these are some of the things that we're just going to do to make sure this person's getting the most out of the lessons and um, that we're accommodating and making sure they're getting that um, same access to the curriculum. Uh, substantial might be collaborating with external uh, stakeholders. So having a talk to the speeches about what works, to the psychologists, and that's private or the ones that are in school as well. So then the, the teacher might have some adjustments to their teaching that they make. So a QDTP one might be the graphic organisers. Extensive uh, might be that some individualised concrete materials are provided for a student so that they're able to access that learning or demonstrate the learning. Learning environment and access. So this is always a good one to have a look at. So things like the lighting and visual distractions, we are very aware that most people get um, concerned about their child if they've got sensory issues. So you can certainly um, have those adjustments made for students to make their life in the classroom calm for them. So there's the QDTP ones there, the considering the noise levels, lighting, the visual distractions, and then the substantial. Um, there might be times when the child needs to have that individual support for moving around the school. There's an example there. Literacy adjustments, that consistent use of assistive tech is actually just supplementary because it's not interrupting with the rigour of the curriculum. Substantial might be, as we mentioned before, adjusting those literacy demands for that student so they align with where they're entering the curriculum. Assessment, supplementary, things like separating the knowledge and skills and assessing them different, uh, individually. For example, if you have a child who you know is able to express um, their understanding of what you've learned in history really well, and but you also want to check out their spelling, you won't do that in one assessment piece. You would assess their knowledge in the document they've created, and then in a very gentle and careful way, you won't um, assess their spelling in another individualized little brief piece of assessment. So not including that in the main assessment. Um, extensive would be modifying assessment to align with the access point. Social and emotional um, supplementary things, doing those individual check-ins with students um, as an example there. Um, substantial would be those frequent supervised breaks, movement breaks that a student might need that are above and beyond what other classmates might need. So it just gives you, it gives you a little bit more of a handle on the range. There are more that um, are available in adjustment types. And we'll talk about the links where you can find out about those later in the presentation. Okay, so here's some little goodies here. Um, as we start having a look at what sort of ways this really does happen in the classroom so that we can get the children um, into the same content, no matter where they are entering the curriculum. So um, some of my little favourite books that I go to um, uh, by a lady called Dr. Paula Klutz. She was out in Australia earlier this year. And we were very lucky here to attend um, a few of her workshops. So these are two great books. And I've just popped up some samples of pages there. So I've got an idea of how to get children. And these might be more for children who are at um, any level really, but I know these are sorts of things that I turn to um, and I'm sort of talking to my son's school because he's at that extensive end of adjustment. So there's a little tap light indicator. So there's these little lights you can get um, that when the child taps on them, they can let the teacher know that they've got something to say um, to be part of that conversation. Um, little stackable cups. You can see the example there that they've used for getting the child to express what they know about a food chain. But there's all sorts of ways those sort of stackable ideas can work for students. And the Venn diagrams are excellent. And look at that way there that they've used like the hula hoops, getting the child to show, um, compare and contrasting and finding the similarities. So there's a few just little ideas there, but there's so much in those books. But again, we know this is really for the teachers to get their head around, but it's good for parents to, to know that these things are possible. Okay. Also important here to note that that language-friendly instruction is important everywhere and at every time. 
So I've popped up here uh, a little bit of a rough um, example worksheet that I've done that follows the universal design principles for language instruction. So what we're looking for is not just that accessible written language instruction, but also accessible oral language instruction. Often teachers will talk very fast. They'll um, put a lot of terms that can bamboozle children. So we're trying to get teachers head around that they need to be not dumbing down at all the way that they're presenting, but they're making the way they present and the words they present with more inclusive. There's an excellent design um, principles checklist that was actually designed for TAFE students here in Queensland. But because it's universal design, the checklist um, just works for anyone in any situation. So that's available via our um, learning page on our uh, fee, fee resources page. So if you have a look there, there's a link to that document. And it's great, it tells you what font, what size, um, talks about that oral uh, language and how to do better with your oral language instruction. And as you can see here with my um, activity sheets, I've tried to provide those visual supports, vocabulary supports and scaffolding and making the document too, so that if they were to use um, an iPad or a laptop to have it read aloud to them, that they can easily. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Lindy, who's gonna take you through some more work samples that she's um, yeah, been aware of for a while and that she loves. So I'll hand over to Lindy now. Lindsay. All right. So here's an example. Um, now this has been shared before at previous um, conferences and things. Um, of just a very simple way of assessing um, my girl back in year six science. And it's, it's assessing the knowledge um, and it was even requiring a short answer down the bottom, uh, which you can see her answer was gross. Um, so the question was something about, you know, pouring milk on a breakfast cereal and, and it tastes sour, you know, should Ben eat his breakfast? Yes or no? She circled no. And why do you think that? She's written gross. So, and, and then um, the teacher's been able to pull out, obviously, in discussion with her a little bit more. So, um, so you can see, like, with using true or false, having a very clear visual in assessment, um, using those little matching um, words with descriptions to, to check um, understanding of terminology, uh, multiple choice, all of that sort of stuff there is a way of assessing. Um, uh, for years now, Millie has um, uh, enjoyed being the very important um, photographer in science lab work, and um, and this has this came about because um, she was obviously very curious and interested in engaging with all the different exciting things that are in um, a science lab room. So this gave her a way of being able to actually. Uh, play a very important role when she was um, in group work um, doing pracs. She took the photos at each step and that helped the whole group be able to actually fill in um, their prac reports. The other thing too that um, teachers have done for her is scaffolded really nice and clearly, um, you know, method, etc. you know, materials, safety considerations, all into like a Word document. And, um, and then she has inserted all the, the relevant information in underneath those, and that's made her very successful. Um, industrial tech and design um, is something that she's loved, but we've been really, uh, obviously safety is a consideration. And I, I hear a lot um, of challenges. Some parents you know, are met with opposition when their children do love um, such um, you know, subjects that involve a lot of things like band saws or things that could do a lot of damage. Um, we have worked with our school to be able to ensure that Millie is with um, supportive peers and, um, and not um, just having a teacher aid. And also uh, they were very clear in setting out how the safety considerations were, were going to happen from week to week, depending on the plan. So um, something to keep in mind that, that things are possible, it just takes a little bit of um, intention and planning. Um, other things that are really important to know, especially in your high school years, 
um, if there's like a, a booklet or some sort of project that everyone's got one of, um, it's still important for every child to have such a thing and for it to look very much the same. And that's something that hasn't always been the case for Millie. Um, and, but it is a very important thing. So while um, she might have a booklet that's quite differentiated, so this is one that was differentiated for writing a narrative, um, had a lot more visuals, a lot more clear instructions of how to, to um, set out and plan her narrative. It looked very much the same as how everybody else's booklet looked. And you could also even see, um, because uh, our school uses OneNote, and which is a, a Microsoft um, application. And you could see, so the, the general version that um, other kids were using, and then you could see Millie's and you could see that there was a plan over the weeks where there were group activities where everyone was doing very much the same thing. And so the links were the same. And, and so she was talking all about the same stuff, but having a differentiated list of questions and answers and, and a structure for her to be able to respond successfully while participating in the group with her peers. Um, this is from a, another student um, in senior English and um, the mum um, described that there was a scaffold um, when they were reviewing the novel. Um, so um, the student didn't need to be reading the novel as such. Um, he listened to an audio book and watched the movie and then the teacher actually helped by um, setting out this scaffold to, to pull the information out of him of what he'd learnt and be able to structure his responses. Um, there's also an example on the side there of how it sort of looks. If you've got a child who is on an individualised curriculum plan, so is accessing like in, in somewhere in senior school or high school, um, English at a different year level, and this one is in year four, how it sort of looks. So the teacher is able to pull out the equivalent part um, of, of whatever they're assessing and, um, and, and then be able to mark the child at that level. So you can see that this child, while they're, they're in high school, they're accessing and being assessed at year four level in an individualized curriculum plan. And you can see this child's actually sort of around an A or B, which means they'll probably then get um, reviewed and um, bumped along um, up, up to a higher access point. Um, here's an example of um, secondary maths and how a child is supported to engage at um, curriculum level. So um, this is a really important area So, and it's taken a while for me to understand as well. Um, Rhonda Farragher, we're very lucky to have at the University of Queensland and this is really her passion for research. Um, and this is a quote of hers, engaging with secondary mathematics content is an important way to continue the development of mathematical understanding across the discipline. It also allows learners to engage in the conversation and experiences of other learners in an inclusive classroom setting. It's indeed possible to engage meaningfully with year level appropriate curriculum while not having mastered earlier concepts. And that's a really important part because a lot of high school students have in the past and, and maybe in the present been kept constantly doing those numeracy activities from year one, year two, um, not necessarily going forward. Um, and in high school, that is just, you know, a, a real shame. And, and Rhonda says that everybody deserves to be able to, to enjoy, you know, maths. So, um, so here's an example of, this is actually the same students work in the one year. Um, he started off doing very basic um, numeracy, as you can see, addition and subtraction of single digits. And in the same year with the right supports, he's doing, you know, Sokotoa. So he's doing, um, he's learning, you know, how to apply things to triangles and, and using formulas and, and that sort of thing. And that's really with a very clearly set out structure and using a calculator. Rhonda really emphasizes that a calculator is the best tool for children who are really stuck at those early years. Um, now, as, as Ainsley said, it is actually um, just quality differentiated teaching practice to be able to, to support students to feel comfortable um, in, a, in, a, you know, um, in a way that they can take a break or, um, or consider lighting, noise, that sort of thing. 
Um, this is a, a way that a student has actually used um, zones of regulation. There's lots of different tools. Um, the, the main point is that if, if there's something your child is needing, it is important to actually communicate that with your class teacher and to, um, and to review that. Um, if something is going on, it's really hard to learn if you're not comfortable. So uh, it's important to be building sk skill and having it in the context of a child actually uh, recognising what they're needing and being able to put that in place and being supported to do so by their school. Um, and timetabling is a really um, easy way of seeing like the, the differentiation is really important. So this is um, an example of my girls' timetable. Uh, a lot of high school timetables are really complicated little things with all sorts of codes for the teacher and the, the class um, subject and that sort of thing. Um, we always transfer it into something that's nice and easy and we color code it according. And, and she even has her, her folders in her locker that she can pull out that are all color coded according to the subject. Um, it means that she it doesn't take so long for her because it does just generally take longer for her to get her things organized. Um, and, and that's important. I once heard a, a, a student speak about their experience of high school and it was actually sort of predetermined without consultation um, with the student that uh, they wouldn't be carrying their books, that things would be kept in the varying classes. And, and that was something that they actually didn't like. They wanted to feel like one of the students, just one of the high schoolers and, and be able to participate um, by lugging their stuff everywhere. It's an important um, part, of, part of high school. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna hand back to Ainsley um, to talk about adjustment ideas. Now I'm very aware of time with that little hiccup we had before. We've run a little bit later than hope, so I'll try and get through these quickly, but so that you can get your understanding of them. So um, some extra adjustment ideas that we just wanted to have on hand for you. I will be emailing out the PDF of this PowerPoint, so don't feel as though you've got to write everything down. I meant to say that earlier. Um, but some adjustment idea resources to go to. The Australian Curriculum Glossary is very good. So it has a section where you can type in different terms and it will come up with what the Australian Curriculum says uh, or defines that term as. It's very interesting to type in writing and it will come in um, and it will state everything but physical writing. So it just lets you know that writing can be writing with your voice, it can be typing. There's all sorts of ways that you can present that traditionally written text. Um, the Queensland Curriculum um, Authority there, the QCAA Assessment Authority, they have a, a tab there called Personalised Learning, and that will take you through to lots of information about the um, different adjustments and what can be done. So that's worth having a look in there. And that's very Queensland based, which is handy too for Queenslanders. Um, we've got our own crew excellent resource called Is the Adjust Adjustment Inclusive? Again, that's on our crew um, FIFB resources page in the learning section. So it provides you sort of examples and, and good examples and poor examples and how that should be worked through, um, working out whether yeah, the adjustment that you've got is actually an inclusive adjust, adjustment. Um, a little hiding uh, document that we've, we've come across from the Department of Education Queensland that we like to get out there because it's a good one is an assessment and moderation document in prep to year 10. So it talks about how to go about the assessment and moderation. And in particular, um, there's a section there that's handy about special provisions for students with disability. So well worth a look at. There's also another document called Supporting Students in Queensland Schools. So if you Google those with Department of Education Queensland, I'm hoping that you can find them. They're not really easy to find on the website. You'll have to do a particular Google. Um, the NCCD has excellent information there for parents. There's some parent um, pages there on their website. And there's also podcasts for teachers, but they're very good for everybody because they go through specific disabilities and talk about what adjustments could be made in the classroom. So they're experts just talking about it. Not too difficult for parents to um, get their head around because it's, it's done the very inclusive way that they speak about it. Um, Interesting to note that a lot of schools often think that, you know, I need to adjust one way for a child with autism, another way for a child with cerebral palsy, another way for this child. 
And often what you'll find within those podcasts is that there's very similar things being mentioned and that's that universal design really. If we can adjust for, for one child, we can often adjust for many. It's like having that ramp and getting rid of the stairs, everyone can enter. Um, there's an excellent document, particularly if you've got a high schooler, um, called 21 Simple Design Elements that will make any school assessment task sheet accessible. That's by a Queensland researcher called Linda Graham and many others that work with her. So that one's a good one and it's not too difficult to read. And as I have mentioned in a couple of breakout rooms, sometimes after a meeting with school, I might just pop in a link saying, oh, I, I came across this article. I thought it might be helpful. Just one link here and there can, can help open up eyes for teachers. Um, understood.org is an excellent site to go to. In particular, this article I found has really cut through for a number of children that I know um, for their teachers, which is advocating for my son's dysgraphia, which talks about a mum's journey of trying to get school to shift to that assistive technology. And um, yeah, sometimes when teachers hear stories written in parent words, it seems to cut through to them. Okay. So then that brings us to the consultation process, which um, schools are obliged to, to do. And it's important that we hold them up to it. We do hear a few stories here at Crew where parents are quickly at the school gate being asked to sign um, ICPs and other NCCD documents. And really you need to be having proper consultation. So what does that look like? Well, there's been an excellent new document come out from QUT. Again, not a hefty read. It is um, meant for teachers, but it's a good one for parents to have a look at. And I've got an image of that there in the corner. And again, when we send out the slides, you'll be able to have all that on hand to be able to have a little search. But it talks about what that consultation process should look like, particularly for students with communication difficulties. So a good quality consultation should look like there should be clarity before the meeting on who will be attending so you know who's going to be there. And as we say, it's always best to take along a person with you to that meeting, not to go on your own. Um, that they make sure they've got a good rapport happening, particularly with the students, because we want the students as much as we can to be part of these consultations. That there's a supportive environment. They're not going to be in some tiny room or in the, the corner of the library where it's really noisy having this meeting they make sure that that's looking and sounding like a place where the child will feel comfortable in the parent. Um, effective questioning is being used. Again, that language friendly instruction should come into the consultation. Appropriate stimulus material. So if the student needs some images that they can select for their adjustments that they'd like, that they're provided. It might be multiple shorter conversations. So there might be three little conversations over the beginning of the term or the end of the last term. Um, as to how these adjustments will take place so that the student doesn't feel overwhelmed in one long meeting. There should be confirmation of student comprehension. The um, guide talks about how that can be done to make sure that they've understood what is um, going to take place and that the child is happy with those adjustments and that the parents are happy too. And there should be follow-up and review. So it's not just, yep, we've done it now. It should be towards um, the midterm, how are these adjustments going, a little bit of feedback going between school, home and the student. And then at the end of the term or semester, right, how did those adjustments go? Were they affected? Were they not? How can we improve? Okay, so do we have time for a little breakout room before we wrap up, Lindy? I think yeah, my watch is saying it's faster than what it is here. So yes, um, we're gonna spend a couple of minutes now, probably two or three, just sharing any tips before we go into our advocacy slide that you may already have that you would like to share for curriculum inclusion. And then we will share our crew tips for you. Thank you. Hello and welcome back in. I hope you got a chance to have a good natter there about the advocacy tips, which I'm going to share more of now. And I have to um, say sorry to the person that I was in a breakout room with, because I was about to say basically what's on the next slide. So sorry, we got cut off, but it's about to be shown to you. Now, I don't think my slide's coming up again. Is that That's right, still, yeah. do I need to share it again? And I'll make sure I get the correct one. I think it's this one here. Yeah, yeah good. Okay, so we've done our breakout room. 
Okay, so tips for advocating for your child's curriculum inclusion. So number one, come to our advocacy resources. They're excellent. So we have information on our crew resources page about advocacy. There's an advocacy tab. And there's also um, some fact sheets. So if you have a look in the little drop down boxes in the Fifi um, and in the crew um, on the crew website, you'll see fact sheets and go to the inclusive education. And um, I've got an image of one of those fact sheets there as well. So they're really handy. Um, know the policies, legislation and standards. So there's um, uh, disability standards for education. Get to know if you're in Queensland in particular, the um, inclusive education policy. A good book that we've got um, now that we've just updated is um, I Choose Inclusion, which um, steps you through a lot of those policies, legislation and standards, and points you in directions for finding out more. So having your head around those is, is really helpful. Um, keeping your expectations. We talked about this in just in our break, breakout room. So when teachers are trying to drop down those expectations, you've got to keep letting them know that if they've got a presumed competency for your child, um, that's really important. Um, and, and yourself having the, the confidence in the, the teachers or having the expectation for the teachers and for their peers to step up to, to be involved in their learning. I know from teaching year ones right through to year sixes and sevens that I have seen peers do amazing things at any age and stage that have just taken a whole lot of workload off the teacher because they're doing it so much better than I could have. Um, they're focused on focusing on the strengths and finding ways to reduce those barriers. So always looking out, what are the barriers, what's happening here that's stopping them from being able to access this learning and, and looking at how we can use their strengths to enter it. And using key terms can really help. So often we say here at Crew, it's not best to roll up and with your um, inclusive education policy or your disability standards printed out, but dropping some of the key terms will let them know and, and trigger educators, oh, that, that's from the disability standards. And so some of those key terms I've got here on the right, so hopefully they pop up now for you. So things like on the same basis as students with disability, reasonable adjustments, consultation. Um, you want things happening in reasonable time. I'm seeing some screenshots there. We'll get the PDF out though, but feel welcome. Um, quality differentiated, I got it right. Teaching practice and the supplementary extensive adjustments, all those sorts of language will just, um, yeah, often just, oh yeah, I, I do need to relook at what I'm doing here for this student. And I like that quite at the bottom that um, advocacy is time consuming and it can be frustrating. Um, but where there is a will, there is a way. So you've got to keep looking for that will and, and keeping your will strong too. And yeah, keep working that way to try and make sure that your child's got those, those best ways ahead. Okay, so if those people who are able to hang on a little bit, we might see if we've got some questions that you would like to ask and we'll have a go at answering them. So Lindy, the best process usually is if someone raises their hand that right with a little hand icon and we'll, we'll flick you over to you and ask you to take your mic off, um, put your mic back on or take unmute it. So if anyone's got a question now, and of course, if you've got an individual one, you're welcome to ring us at crew for a consultation. If you think of anything afterwards, you again, well, welcome to email or to um, call as well. Okay. Well, I think we're almost ready then to, to start finishing up and we have gone over time and it's Melbourne Cup Day so we better get going. So I've mentioned our resources lots of times so I don't think I need to do too much more there. Keep your eye out, we're getting around and doing more face-to-face -face workshops. We have started with mainly regional areas this term because it's been a while since we've been out there but um, in 2000, uh, sorry 2021 um, we'll be getting out more so keep an eye on our calendar for that. Uh, we'll, we will do where we can to keep presenting online options as well. And yes, those individual consultations. And don't forget, um, keep an eye on peer support in your local area. For us in Queensland, it's a Queensland Collective for Inclusive Education, where you can map more of this out with um, people in your local area. Okay. And that's going to wrap us up today. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Hopefully we've a little bit more of a fire within you to keep advocating on 
and looking for ways to bring down the barriers for your children. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to Lindy who has co-presented with me today. Thank you for putting up with a few little tech issues and my um, pronunciation issues, <laughs> nervousness, but thank you everybody. And um, we hope you do enjoy your day. All right, we'll close the meeting. Thank you. Bye.